moment of inertia and rotational dynamics going to be the topic of this lesson my brand new general physics playlist which when completed will cover a full year of university algebra based physics now in the last lesson we talked about rotational equilibrium and we took a look and, and used Newton's first law in translational equilibrium and saw that there was a rotational analog to that. Well, in this lesson, we're talking about uh, objects that are not in rotational equilibrium. And in the same sense where we use Newton's second law for objects that are not in translational equilibrium, we'll see there's a rotational analog to that as well. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Okay, so let's go back a second so and talk about equilibrium and, and just rehash the last lesson. So in the last lesson, we talked about uh, a review of when objects are in equilibrium, the sum of the force equals zero. And then we went and said, well, when an object is in rotational equilibrium, the sum of the torques will equal zero. Well, in this lesson, we're not dealing with objects in equilibrium now. They're gonna have a net torque on them, and so they're not in rotational equilibrium. Well, in the same sense, when, when objects had a net force on them, they were not in translational equilibrium. And in such cases, we used Newton's second law of motion and said that the sum of the forces equals ma. Well, in similar fashion, now it's gonna be the sum of the torques are gonna to equal I times alpha. And so in a rotational sense, torque is analogous to force and angular acceleration is analogous to uh, translational acceleration. But we're gonna find out that the moment of inertia is also analogous to mass here in this case. And so in the same way that mass is kind of the resistance to getting an acceleration. So a given force is gonna cause a smaller acceleration with a larger mass. Well, same thing here. The moment of inertia is kind of the resistance to being given a rotational or angular acceleration. So for a given torque, net torque in this case, uh, you're going to get a smaller angular acceleration if you have a larger moment of inertia. All right, so let's see kind of how we derive this from Newton's second law. So if we start with F equals MA, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides by the position vector here, which so will be analogous to lever arm. And so we get FR equals MRA. And what we wanna do is actually derive this rotational equivalent of Newton's second law here. And so that's why you multiply by R here because force times lever arm is going to be torque. And so in this case, we now got torque on that side. So, but we also know that A is equal to R times alpha. And so we can substitute R alpha in for A right here. So, and now we can finally see that we've got torque equaling MR squared times alpha. So, and it is that quantity mr squared that is the moment of inertia. And so we've now derived that the moment of inertia is actually equal to the sum of the mr squared term. So if you've just got a single mass rotating, you know, uh, around some axis of rotation, uh, then you've got a simple equation here of mass times the radius squared to get that moment of inertia. But if you've got a more complex object, and, and maybe it's just some system of point masses that are all somehow connected by some matrix or something, and then you just gotta add up every single point mass's mass times its radius squared and add them all together to get the overall moment of inertia of the system. Now, for more complex shapes, and I put a bunch of them on the study guide here, so, and these are some that you might encounter. Typically, these aren't things students have to uh, memorize. They're typically things that are supplied, but if your professor has you memorize them, by all means, memorize them. Um, but for different shapes and for where they're rotating, there are different formulas for the moment of inertia. So if you've got a rod, so like this marker here, rotating about its center, so turns out the moment of inertia here is gonna be 1 12th ml squared, where m is the mass of the rod and l is the length of the rod. Whereas if it's rotating around one end, let's say, so, well, that moment of inertia is gonna change a little bit, and it turns it's gonna be equal to one-third ml squared. So, and then if you've got a solid sphere, there's a formula for that. And if there's a hollow spherical shell, there's a formula for that. So, and same thing for a solid cylinder or disc and a hollow cylinder or disc. There are formulas for that, and you just simply look them up. Now, one thing we should keep in, into, take into account here is with that moment of inertia, so is look at how the distance from the axis of rotation plays a role R here. So the larger that distance from the axis of rotation, the larger the moment of inertia. And again, you can think of that moment of inertia as like the resistance to changing its angular acceleration. 
So what the resistance is to giving it an angular acceleration, I say the change to changing its angular velocity is rather how I should have said that. So in this case, what you find is that if, if an object has more of its mass concentrated towards the center, uh, where its axis of rotation is, it's gonna have a lower moment of inertia because it's gonna have lower R values. But if you have an object where most of its mass is concentrated further away from the axis of rotation, then it's gonna have a larger moment of inertia. And so like for a solid sphere con compared to a spherical shell, in fact, actually I'm gonna save that because that's in the next problem. So we take an, uh, into account like a, an ice skater. So when an ice skater wants to rotate rather quickly, so that ice skater, he or she will tuck their arms and legs in and they'll spin faster. Well, what, what you find out is the reason they're spinning faster is, is a topic we'll talk, uh, talk about in the next lesson called angular momentum and the fact that it's going to be conserved. So, but when they tuck their arms and legs in, they're bringing more of their mass in towards the center, towards that axis of rotation, and it lowers their moment of inertia. And so, and again, that's the resistance to wanting to spin faster. And so, lo and behold, they're going to spin faster with a higher angular velocity. So, uh, and we'll get into that a little more in the next lesson with the conservation of angular momentum. We'll talk about that example specifically in a little more detail. So let's take a look at our first question here. And this one's not going to be a calculation. It's going to be conceptual in nature. So, but it simply says, which of the following has the greatest moment of inertia? A solid wood sphere or a hollow gold sphere of equal mass and radius? All right, so don't worry about the wood versus gold part of it. So it's really more about the solid sphere versus the hollow sphere. That's the big difference here. And they have the same mass, same radius. That's the big deal. So notice uh, for a hollow sphere to have the same mass and radius, so it's gonna have to be a more dense material for that to be possible. And that's definitely true. Gold is more dense than wood. All right, so again, the question really comes down to, if you wanna see it conceptually, which of these is gonna have more of its mass concentrated away from the axis of rotation. And that's definitely the hollow one. All of its mass is fairly far, far out away from that axis of rotation, comparatively speaking, compared to that solid sphere, which has you know, all of its mass kind of uniformly distributed from all the way in to all the way out uh, by that axis of rotation. So for the hollow gold sphere, so it's gonna have a larger moment of inertia, so having more of its mass concentrated away from that axis of rotation. And if we take a look at the solid sphere versus the hollow sphere, so the solid sphere, has a moment of inertia of two-fifths mr squared right off the sheet here, whereas that thin spherical shell is one-half mr squared. And so for the hollow spherical shell, we said it should be higher, and yeah, one-half mr squared is larger than two-fifths mr squared. Notice that's the same thing as four-tenths, and that's the same thing as five-tenths. And so once again, that's hollow spherical shell. So conceptually said, more of the mass is concentrated away from the axis rotation, it should be higher. And we can verify that if we take a look at those formulas. And once again, you typically don't have to memorize these formulas. They're typically provided for you. Uh, and I will make a habit of that. If you need it in a question, I will typically provide it for you. So the next question we'll take a look at is a calculation. It says a 50.0 Newton force is applied perpendicularly to a door 0 0.80 meters from the hinge. If the moment of inertia of the door is 80.0 kilogram meter squared, then what is the resulting angular acceleration of the door? So we're gonna solve for that angular acceleration. And in this case, what we really need then, so is the equivalent, again, the rotational equivalent of Newton's second law, and it's the sum of the torques equals I alpha. So, and don't forget that torque is equal to the perpendicular component of the force times the lever arm. All right, well, in this case, our entire force is perpendicular and the lever arm distance is given. We know how far away from the hinge it is. And so we have enough information to calculate the torque. And it's the only source of torque in this case, the only torque we gotta worry about. And so we know the sum of the torques. So the moment of inertia is provided and we can simply calculate alpha here in this case. And so again, force times lever arm. So 50.0 Newtons times 0 0.80 meters equals, and again, the moment of inertia was given as 80. 0.0 kilogram meter squared times alpha. And in this case, then we can solve for alpha. So here, uh, notice that 0.8 is the same thing as 4 fifths. 4 fifths times 50 is 40. And then 40 divided by 80 is going to be 1 half or 0 0.5. And written with, in this case, we need two sig figs based on the 0 0.80 meters. So 0 0.50. And in this case, that's radians per second per second or radians per second squared. There is our angular acceleration. So the last question here is going to involve what we call disc brakes, common brakes uh, on most cars and trucks these days. Typically have one of these on every single one of your wheels. And 
Uh, question says, disc brakes work when brake pads are brought into contact with a metal disc connected to a wheel. The resulting friction slows down the rotation of the wheel. The braking system for a wheel involves a metal disc with a mass of 4.0 kilograms and a radius of 0.25 meters. If the brake pads contact the disc at an average radius of 0.20 meters, what average force of kinetic friction must be applied by the brake pads on the disc to bring the disc to rest from an initial angular velocity of 1200 radians per second in 6.0 seconds. So a lot in this question. So if you take a look, the way this, so you got this metal disc that's attached to every single one of your wheels inside the tire. So, uh, and I don't mean inside the tire itself, but just inside of the tire. So uh, I should specify how I, I say that. Uh, but in this case, you got a brake pad on every, either side of this metal disc. And when you depress the brake pedal, there are calipers that bring those pads into contact with the metal disc. They're not normally in contact, but when you depress the brake pedal, they're brought into contact, causing friction, which then slows down this metal disc, which then slows down the wheel and slows down your car. So that's how it works. All right. So in this case, we want to calculate the force of kinetic friction applied by these brake pads. Well, if we take a look at this for a second, so right where these brake pads are coming into contact with this wheel, let's say that this wheel is rotating in the counterclockwise direction. Well, if we take a look at the tangential velocity at any point, it's tangent to the circle, and right at the point where the brake pads hit, that tangential velocity points directly to the left. So what you might recall about friction is kinetic friction is a non-conservative force. It always opposes the motion. It's always exactly opposite the direction of motion. In this case, opposite the direction of that tangential velocity. And so in this case, that force of kinetic friction points exactly to the right. So and what's convenient is that it's always going to be pointing to the right where the brake pads are located and therefore perpendicular to our lever arm right here. And so the force that's causing this torque is always perpendicular to the lever arm, which makes calculating that torque a little bit easier. So let's go back and look at this for a second. So the sum of the torques equals I alpha. And the part of the torque we want to calculate is that force of friction is responsible for it times the lever arm. So and in this case equals I alpha. Now we got a little bit of work cut out for us. So we want that force. We do know the lever arm that's going to be 0.2 meters. So, but we don't know the moment of inertia just yet. We're gonna to have to calculate it. So fortunately provided on the previous page was the formula for the moment of inertia of a solid disc. It's one half MR squared. Again, most of the time that is not something you're supposed to memorize. It's something that's either provided or that you'll be able to look up on a table or a chart just like on the previous page of the study guide there. So one half MR squared, so we'll substitute that in. So uh, moment of inertia is gonna be one half MR squared. So, and then alpha here, we gotta calculate that as well. We're not provided it, but we are given the initial velocity, in this case, angular velocity, 1200 radians per second. It's brought to rest, so the final angular velocity is zero, and we know the time is all done in six seconds. Well, the definition of angular velocity is change in, I'm sorry, the definition of angular acceleration is change in angular velocity over the change in time. And now we can start plugging some things in. So again, that force of friction is what we wanna solve for. So our lever arm distance is the 0 0.20 meters where the brake pad comes into contact with the disc. It's equal to one half. The mass of the disc is given as four kilograms. So times the radius squared. In this case, the radius of the disc is 0 0.25 meters. Got to remember to square that. And then change in angular velocity over change in time is just final minus initial. Well, the final is zero. The initial was 1,200 radians per second all over 6.0 seconds so a lot of work going into this one and a rather long calculation but not a particularly you know difficult calculation just a bunch of algebra here in this case so let's see how this plays out so force of friction is going to equal and we'll let our calculator definitely do some work for us although we could probably do quite a bit of this in our head so but one half times four is obviously going to be two like I said, I'll let my calculator do the work. So 0.5 times four times 0.25 squared, which is times the fourth squared, uh, and then times negative 1200 over six. I'll put that in parentheses. So times in parentheses, negative 1200 divided by six. Uh, so far we're at negative 25, and then we've got to divide through by 0.2, which same thing as multiplying by five. So this should come out to negative 125. So divided by 0.2, gives us negative 125 newtons. Cool.
Cool, and the fact that it's negative is purely directional. So again, keep in mind that the velocity of the disc is going this way, the force of friction is in the opposite direction. That's why it is indeed negative. If you have found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.